Already, everybody, today's uh, Valentine's Day. Wow, that's why I'm wearing pink. Well, I do wear pink, pink sometimes, but especially today, uh, we are celebrating Valentine's Day uh, with the one and only Chris Hunting Ford. I think if I say this today, it's not going to be weird by any means, but uh, Chris, I love you, my friend. Thank you, you so much for... for <laughs> making your time available and your brains available uh, for, for this particular uh, initiative. Uh, we are all uh, grateful uh, for you. Today, Chris is starting a series of two lessons on uh, developing apps using a data-first strategy. So again, lesson three and four will change your life. So Chris, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much again. Thanks, Victor. I had, a, I had a joke made with my friend earlier. She's like, hey, it's Valentine's Day with Victor. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Now, those of you that don't know what Valentine's Day is, it's the day of love, apparently. So yeah, I got a, I got some presents, I'm pretty stoked. Anyway, um, thank you for joining in everyone. I'm gonna share my screen if that's cool. And folks, just as a heads up, every now and then my microphone does some very strange things. So if I go like randomly quiet or something happens, because I never go quiet, but if I do, just like wave your hands or somebody just give me a hands up or something. Um, but I hope it doesn't break. It's been pretty good this week. Right. So um, first things first, um, thank you all for coming along and for Victor for having me. This is really cool. I'm really stoked to be here. And yeah, I love the little caricature, caricatures and everything that, that have been designed. So yeah, thank you for taking time out, folks. So that's me. Oh, sorry, I've got a visitor. Um, that's me. If you guys want to keep in touch, go right ahead. Uh, it's in the slides. You don't have to worry too much about that. And yes, that is a picture of a badger, and I have no idea why I put it there. Right. So now for the real stuff. What we're going to do is we're going to go and take a look at um, <laughs> designing from data upwards. It's something I believe in very strongly, and hopefully that opinion comes through. I've never had a problem getting my opinion across, as some of you know. But yeah. Uh, a lot of people have their own approach. I have my approach and it's worked for me in the past. So I'm just going to share with you what I do and hopefully it makes sense. And um, let me tell you, the rest of the presenters for this course are really amazing. I mean, I think next you got Geetha and then Christina and then Daniel Christian and then there's Leo as well. So you've got some cracking presenters for this, this whole thing. So yeah, I'm dead keen to see what they do. Anyway, we're going to do a little bit of a quiz, right? A little bit of an interactive quiz. So you need your phones or your mobile devices. Um, it's nothing serious. It's just to have a bit of fun, uh, get started uh, in a bit more of an interactive way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that across and go into presentation mode. So feel free to scan. Um, it's really easy to go to www.menti.com and put in the quiz over there or simply scan the QR code and you will land up in our dodgy little quiz. So let's see, hopefully this works. I did, it did earlier, but let's just make sure. There we go. Cool, a couple of you in there. That's awesome. So you'll get to a screen that has like a blank kind of thing. It looks a bit like that. It'll load up eventually. And what I'll do is I'll run you through some questions. Now, it's very basic stuff. Like I said, folks, nothing serious. It's just to have a bit of fun. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask, answer a couple of questions around data. So first things first, how are you feeling today? I know it's a, sometimes a bit tough to say that, so you don't have to say you're awesome. It's cool. Right. And effectively, we'll go through and try and, yeah, shame. I, I, after, after the announcement now about the earthquakes, I feel terrible for asking this. So let's just make sure we're all there for each other. Very, very importantly. Cool. Okay. So next question, right? Where is everyone located? So I am located in Reading, UK. And the accent is South African. So if you were wondering and you really wanted to know, that's effectively where I'm from. And yeah, I've got some pals in the UK that have joined. So thank you everyone for coming along as well. It's really great. Somebody from Gatwick. I'm sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> cool. Belgium. Look at that. We've got such a great mix of people. How awesome. Okay, so next question. Have you any, ever used any of these products before? So I'm hoping you have. Um, and effectively, what we're going to do is we're going to check a couple of boxes. So if you've ever used any of these products, simply check the boxes. So yeah, everyone's used Excel. Um, 
Most people have used PowerPoint, Word, and SharePoint. Yep, great. Cool. I'll ask you a random question. Guess where most of the data in the Power Platform is stored? Stored in SharePoint. Most of the data in the Power Platform is in SharePoint lists, just by the way. Coolness. All right, next one. So what do you know about Power, Power, well, uh, English words, Power Platform? So nothing. Tell me everything. Some things I've heard the name a few times. I know some stuff. I know it all. Victor, I'm your next trainer. This is how we like get people to come on this course and train folks, right? <laughs> awesome. So there's some absolute ninjas. That's good to hear. Okay, I'm going to get pretty nerdy on this call, so I hope everyone's okay with that. That I normally gauge this by uh, this answer. So if people say I'm new, I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> I, might, I might confuse people, so yeah, that's all right. Very well done, everyone. Okay, next one. What is a database? A structured place to store and manage data, some type of a musical instrument, Excel, or not super sure. Okay, so what is a database? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm interested to see. Okay, yeah, you're all right. You're gold. Thank you. Excel is not a bad database. I respect that. Excellent. Next one. Are all databases the same? Yes, that's why we should store everything in Excel. Absolutely not. Right. It depends. And I know that I know this is a trap. I refuse to answer. <laughs> everything with data and me is a trap. I'm just throwing it out there. Right. So are all databases the same? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it depends. Absolutely not. Excellent. Very, very consultative answers, people. It depends. Really well done. Oh, somebody. That's <laughs> a trap. I refuse to answer. Okay, cool. Yes, that's why we should store everything in Excel. No. Okay, cool. Next one. Where is the best place to keep your data? Is it Excel, Access, SharePoint, Dataverse, or SQL? So where would you put your data, right? If you had to hedge your bets, where would you put your data? Now, I have a I have a theory here. Uh, I think that there is one one database to rule them all, or one data storage facility to rule them all. Yes, sequels sequels up there as well. No, <laughs> cool. All right, we nearly done. I promise you. For a laugh, what is this green icon over here? Okay, is it common data service? Dataflex Bro, haha, Project Oakdale, Dataverse, Common Data Flexi o XRM Open Service Verse. So if you know the history, basically um, they stole Dataverse from Dynamics when it was still called XRM. They had a faux pas and called it, uh, they called it Dataflex Pro. Um, I didn't know, I, I figured if you just typed in, it does Dataflex exist into Bing, you could pretty much find out if the name existed, but you know, other people had other different ideas. So yeah, Dataverse it is. Well done, everyone. Why do we capture data? Literally, this is a trap. <laughs> if anyone can figure it out, tell me, okay? Because there is an actual answer as to why we capture data. However, think about it. When you're on an app, why are you putting information in data? Why are you putting data into the app? Cool, so let's have a look. To use it, to manage and store and re for reuse, to understand, yeah? Knowledge equals power. Yes. Well done. To analyze business trends. That's a really good one for reporting. Yep. Great response. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Victor's right. A data flex my, my, my biceps. I actually did that in Estonia recently. I actually forgot I was there. And I was like, ah. No, I'm kidding. To facilitate operations and gain business intelligence. I'm going to send you this report when I'm done. And you can pick the, the closest answer. Well done. All right. So that's that, literally that easy, folks. Presentation's done, you can go home. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's not that simple. All right, so first of all, why is data so important? So thank you everyone very much for sharing that information with me. So the most important thing you're gonna get out of this presentation today is look how cool the Power Platform logos look on a red slide. Yeah, come on. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's literally it. So I don't know if you knew this, but actually um, there, the Power Platform has got two very, very key layers, okay? And these two layers, uh, most people don't ever tell me about this. Like, I've just naturally thought this is the way it works. But the first layer is what you call your interaction layer. And your interaction layer has got like BI and apps and you do things. Uh, I knew somebody was going to call me out on the, on, the, on the connectors logo. Well done. Vorenberg, you get it. You get a. You get it. I don't know. A high five. Congratulations. <laughs> I thought my lo my logo looked better. Anyway, 
No, I'm kidding. So the interaction layer is where people interact with data. So let me ask you a question. You have a SQL database, you work in a contact center. Do you give the SQL database to all your users and say, hey, Andre, go to table number B62 and log into line 68 and just capture some data there? Nope, nope, nope. We put something on top of it. We put an interaction layer on top. So it could be a bot, it could be an app, it could be a power page or power, yeah, power page, it could be a Power BI report. It may even be a Power Automate because sometimes the best user interface is no user interface. So we're always thinking about like how people interact. But the most important layer on the platform is actually the bottom layer, and that's your data layer. In the data layer is where all this stuff is getting tracked and um, you're, you're kind of talking to data a lot of the time. Managed environments for me is still a little odd one out there. I'm trying to figure out if I, if I think it's the right spot for it or not, but certainly these four. Now, I'm very surprised that, yes, number one, I don't have the right connector logo, but number two, why did Microsoft only bring out a connector logo or icon at the very end where connectors are literally the most important part of the platform? I mean, think about it. If you have a Power BI report without data, what does it look like? It's useless. Okay, yes, I know Power BI doesn't use the same connectors as Power Apps, Automate, and, and, and PBA, but it's still pointless having no data in a report. So we supercharge our reports with data to make them look good. Now think about an app. What does an app look like without any data? Oh, little, little, little spaceman over there, super sad, no UFO sightings, no data. So if you're not either getting data or putting data in, what is the point? You may as well use a PowerPoint presentation or a, or a picture. So an app is there to provide you with a mechanism to either put data in or get data out. Super easy. So if I flick this out to my little spaceman over here being very happy with his UFO sightings data, look at how stoked he is there, right? Look at that. There's a picture of a badger there as well. Maybe we should play a game. Every time there's a badger, somebody gives uh, somebody a high five or something. I don't actually know if there are any more badgers. It's just something that happens in presentations with me. Anywho, you can see that this app has now got data. Here's something interesting. This data was not automatically generated. It was captured, and it was captured by Spiff the Spaceman over there. When he was floating through space looking for UFOs, he was putting in data into his power app, and using the great technology of satellites, it was brought back to us and stored in a majestic place called a database. Right. Now, that's pretty good. Now, think about this. Okay, so that app has been supercharged with data. Has, does anyone recognize the slide? I'll be impressed if they do, right? And I don't think Victor's allowed to answer. So this slide was presented by Microsoft in roughly 2020, okay? 2020, 2022, something like that, I can't remember. And these stats are all very familiar. And Microsoft were obsessed with apps, okay? So they kept on talk, talking about apps. So I was like, no, not apps, right? They're called solutions. We don't just make apps. We make lots of things in Power Platform, not just apps. But the point that made me think a lot, and it still is relevant, is this. Is that when you look at the number of organizations with more than 100 terabytes of unstructured data, they've doubled since 2016. That's bananas. Think about the amount of data. And over 85% of them struggle to analyze unstructured data. So they've actually done not even analyzing it properly. Here's something else insane. Do you know that only a maximum of 35% of the data, and the stats is not on the slide. Um, I will find it though. I just couldn't find it before the presentation. And I know you're thinking 20% of stats are made up on the spot, but uh, this one's real. So roughly 35% of the data in any organization is actually analyzed and used. So most of the time we're capturing crap, if I'm honest with you. We have to think about ways to get data better and capture better data. Now, here's a good example. I went to our pal, uh, ChatGPT. Everyone loves a good bit of ChatGPT, yeah? We're getting taken over. We don't have to do our jobs anymore. Just give it to ChatGPT, we're gold, right? So yeah, I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I'm quitting and just gonna give my job to ChatGPT. And I said, dear ChatGPT, happy Valentine's Day. How and why, so why do we need to capture data? So ChatGPT said to me, we capture data to store and analyze information, okay? that can be used for various purposes, such as gaining insights into patterns and trends. Cool. Making informed decisions, improving processes and operations, and supporting research and development. What? Who would have thought that we use data to support research and development? 
Crazy, right? Dates, also that was dripping in sarcasm. A sarcasm was a strawberry, that was a daiquiri. Um, data can come from a whole range of sources. What? So data can come from apps as well and like forms that Victor uses to bring in uh, registrations. Okay. Including business transactions, look, transactions, scientific experiments. Okay, cool. Social media activity. Who would have thought social media keep our data, hey? Unbelievable. I wish we had all known that in the beginning. <laughs> And sensor networks, among others, by capturing and analyzing data, we can extract valuable knowledge and insights that can help us achieve our goals and objectives. I read that and thought, you know what, it's pretty straightforward. We capture data so we can make more informed, quicker decisions. Everyone cool with that? Yeah, that's why we capture data. It's really straightforward. I don't think we need ChatGPT to tell us that we need data to make informed decisions. <laughs> so effectively, when I think about it, I'm like, okay, pretty straightforward. We need data to make decisions. Right, next one. What types of things should we be asking around data? So a lot of the time when I chat to my customers, you know, and I'm looking at solving a problem, we're often talking about building solutions on various layers of data. So if I give you a very quick example, you'll recognize this thing. This is a SharePoint database. We're gonna get back to this thing a little later. And this customer wanted to put data in a SharePoint list. So I looked at the data, I looked at the list, and I want you to pay very careful attention to what data this is, because I'm gonna ask you to do this for homework if you want, right? Look at that data. Now, of course, Microsoft have made it really easy for us to analyze and understand that level of data. So if I just go there and select Power BI, I can go and visualize the list really quickly. Now you're probably thinking this is about power apps, isn't it? Yes, it is. But you need to understand what data you're looking at and why, right? So when thinking about designing a solution, understand the levels of data you're dealing with, okay? Now this is for environment, so environment social and governance interests. So when there was, when there are crisis happening in various places where there is environmental things that need attention, typically people log interest and track these types of causes, okay? Let's think about some other type of data. What about something a little bit more difficult, right? So Victor would have showed you, Victor showed you the model-driven app stuff. And this is more around tracking like library books or files within a company. So you can see over here, I've got lots of different types of data, related data, okay? And all that information is brought to a localized place inside an, a layer of analytics. This chart looks like it's giving me the middle finger. Who would have thought? So if you have a look, you can see by status, you can see by type, it's really cool, right? So I'm not looking at a single line of data. I'm looking at a bunch of tape data brought together inside an application. Very cool. And so on and so forth. So you'll have lots of different types of data. You'll have financial services data. You'll have HR data. If you're in retail, you'll have retail and store data. I'm a rock nerd. I, I, I have rocks all over my room. I track minerals. Believe it or not, yes, my friend helped me build an app for that. So there's lots of pieces of data you can track. If you're in a water utilities, you're gonna track leaks all over your county, right? Or place you live. So there's lots of pieces of data we track. So when people ask me, hey, Chris, you know, I don't understand why this whole apps from data thing makes sense. I'm like, well, first of all, what, what problem are you trying to solve? And I try and understand exactly what, what type of issue there is. The second thing I ask them is, do you currently have a place for your data? All right, now this is a tricky one. Because a lot of people, when talking to them, say, yes, they do have a place for their data. And that's where I challenge. I say, well, is that the right place for your data? Is it okay to keep your data in there? Should you be doing that? So before I've even thought of the app, I'm thinking about the type of data that they're storing and why, all right? The third thing I say is, well, tell us more about the data you want to store and its purpose. So what are you doing with that data? What's the goal? I ain't building you a single app until you tell me what the goal of that data is. Because I'll tell you what, folks, just building apps willy-nilly on top of data is not doing anyone any favors. It's better to understand the type of data you're building on top of and why it's there, okay? So here's something probably uh, that may be a little scary. You can't just put data wherever you want, my friends. It doesn't work that way. In fact, if data is not tracked, managed, and correctly audited, people get fined and even face a more severe legal action. Did you know that? Ever heard of a thing called GDPR? Okay, 
So I ain't building you any apps until I know where your data is and it's safe. I can build a thousand Canvas apps. And in fact, I can make you a Canvas app on top of that SharePoint list in 30 seconds. Does that solve the problem of making sure the data is safe and correct? No. What it does do is gives us another route into the data. Pretty crazy, right? So what are your options? What do we do? Because I'm kind of freaking you guys out now. I'm like, don't put data everywhere. You can't just do that. It's not okay. I think it was 4% of annual revenue on GDPR fines. Anyone know what a subject access request is? Do you know that in the UK and most of Europe, you're allowed to log a thing called a subject access request where the company legally has to provide you with every piece of data and communication they have about you? Right? Every single one that is compliant. Yeah. And that's not only in the UK. That's in a lot of places. Talk about Germany. Data in Germany, you don't mess with that. Pushing data outside of Germany is scary. Anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> I've seen some, some interesting things. So folks, what are the options? Like how, how can we help you? Okay, so before I build you any apps, before I show you any apps, before I go ahead and make you something really cool, how do we make sure we're doing the right thing? Because guess what? Do you know how many apps I've seen thrown out by companies who don't do their research on this first? When InfoSec get hold of that, when InfoSec get hold of applications and it goes through an InfoSec review, the app may be as beautiful as anything you could have ever seen. In fact, that app may do backflips for you. But if the data ain't safe, you're going to replatform that app as quick as anything, right? So that's why I don't even bother building the app before I understand the data. So there are always answers, and I'm going to show you how to do this. All right, I'm going to show you literally how to do this, okay? And once you get into a process of doing data before the app piece, you'll start understanding a little bit more around why data is so critical. So first of all, did you know that in most companies, data is classified into various categories? Every company, especially in places like pharmaceuticals, healthcare, central governments, it's all classified. A lot of it is put into various categories. It's like private, personal, public. Second of all, where is the data located? Anyone on this call from Germany will tell you that if the data is not in Germany, there are often issues. Think about places, and Andre, I know you're grinning. <laughs> places like China, okay? Places like South Africa, they've got a thing called Poppy, which I'll explain later. The name's very cool though. Where is your data located? Yeah. Second of all, what third of all, what level of security is required in your data? Can everyone see everything? Do you need to have your data siloed by invisible walls? In a SharePoint list, yes. I can just assign groups of people to my data, but like everyone can see everything then. What data retention is required? How long do I keep data for and why? Is there a roadmap for data? So if I'm building out a model and I build 5,000 SharePoint tables, how do I extend that? How do I grow that? What about validation rules on that data? Who owns the data? Oh, get into that one. Do you know that if you physically have a record in a company, that data belongs to you? It doesn't belong to the company. You are the data owner, yeah? How much data is there? If you've got 5 million records, are we using SharePoint as a data structure or are we flicking out to something like SQL, okay? What level of complexity is the data? Do you have 15 different overlaying tables? Do you have like, you know, 15,000 different people that have different categories and those different categories require other categories and subcategories? How fat is the data, right? And that's not FAT, that's P-H-A-T, pretty hot and tempting. <laughs> it's Valentine's Day, couldn't help it. How big is the data? How, how detailed is it? And is the data already in another system? So those are the list of things that I look at and that I ask customers all the time. And normally I can tell pretty much by the first two questions, I'm like, yeah, I know what to do here. Okay. If they say the data, cl data classification is, is private, don't even bother moving out into the rest of them. Just say, here's your data source. This is the thing you need to use and use Dataverse or SharePoint. I mean, uh, Dataverse or SQL, not SharePoint. Very key. And I'm going to give you some real life situations. I'm going to show you something interesting. I'm pretty sure some of you back in the day did um, the virtual boot camps that Microsoft provided. I think Vix actually might have done, might have written some of these. I don't know. But a guy, a, a re regional director and MVP, David Yak, put a, a slide like this together. And it talks about balancing, balancing influences of data, right? So what are the security requirements around the data? What is the user experience like? So think about this. 
the data may be private and I'm storing it in Dataverse, but does that make my Canvas app any easier to build? In my opinion, I find Dataverse much easier to build on than SharePoint as far as Canvas apps go. My data location and retention policies, do I have to have multiple versions of the data? Okay. Self-service and reporting needs, how do people build on top of the data? So if my model is massively complicated, can somebody just build a Power BI report on top of it? We don't know. What's the roadmap? Once again, are there existing systems? And localization. So the first thing I do, literally every time, before I even think about making an app, I get something like this up. And I say to folks, all right, what type of data are we looking at? And a lot of the time, a lot of the time, it's personal data. So I guess um, anyone, anyone here ever experienced building out a solution for time and timesheet management before? Tell you, <laughs> it ain't the easiest thing. It's not as simple as just tracking a person's record into a system and then whacking some time against it like they're doing project service automation. It's a whole lot harder than that, especially when you get into countries that have a very, very strict set of rules against data. And there's hundreds of these things. Here's another version, All right? Look at that. Now there's only four. Oh no, world's ending, four of them. We don't have five, what do we do? Here's one even, oh no, now we've got three. We've got three layers of data. What do we do now? It's literally the same thing every time, right? Some data is high risk, some data is moderate risk, and some data is public, okay? And typically, it doesn't matter, it, 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 sorry, typically it really matters where you put this data. As an example, I am not putting financial data inside a SharePoint list or an Excel document. I can t categorically tell you that there are companies out there that run in their entire businesses on Excel. But then there was a certain set of people in the UK who managed to delete 15,000 records, can't tell you who it is now, 15,000 records out of an Excel database during COVID. Oh, Excel database as well, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I'm gonna get a fine, right? So. Please tell me, my friends, does it help your customer to build an app on top of that Excel spreadsheet? No, it doesn't. You're not doing them any help. Yeah. So start thinking about where the data needs to go and why it needs to go there. And I've worked with organizations from five people to literally 500,000 people, and it's the same discussion every time. Okay. For me, the data and where it's put is the most important thing. Let me show you a couple of things here. So I spoke to you about the general data protection regulation. I've got links in the in the um at the end of the documents. So just a bit of a shout out to Gulshan. Thanks for the feedback, pal. I've put in like a bunch of feedback links. So yeah, hopefully Gulshan will give me a thumbs up later on. And uh, effectively, when you start thinking about the country you're building in, okay, I just wanted to use these two to highlight it. But even the states have got varying varying layers of um what you can do when building out solutions. Here's an example: GDPR is fundamentally about protecting and enabling the privacy rights of individuals. The GDPR, the GDPR establishes general prote data protection regulation, establishes strict global privacy requirements governing how you manage and protect personal data while respecting individual choice, no matter where the data is sent, processed, or stored. GDPR, folks, uh, log a subject access request, requesting all your data from a person dealing with your data, and guess what? They've got to give you everything. Now, I know Microsoft Compliance Center have a way of packaging it up in a nice little file. I'm not including that in here because we're talking about apps. Let's take my homeland, South Africa. The Protection of Private Information, or Poppy Act, of South Africa's equivalent to the EU's GDPR, which set conditions for responsible parties to lawfully process the personal information of data subjects. This is not intended to stop the processing of personal data, but to create legal and security requirements for this collection and use. Again, so let me ask you folks, how okay would it be, would you be if your salary information was stored in a SharePoint list in your business right now? Okay, because I have seen firsthand a company without tenant isolation turned on and another tenant looking at SharePoint lists in that company firsthand out of a trial environment. Yeah, can't do that in Dataverse, but <laughs> pretty crazy. So it's time to think about where we put our data. So the way I see it is I like to get, by the way, sorry for the old Dataverse icon and Teams icon. Yeah, this was a screenshot that I built in Canva and then just didn't bother to update, so I'm sorry. 
But basically, I see data and data storage and the way we put things in data structures a bit like living in a in a house. Okay, so let's think about it like this. If you think about the first layer, right, so the Excel layer, I kind of see that as a a single room dormitory. Now, it's going to be tough to put like twenty people in a single room dormitory because what will happen is you'll run out of facilities, you'll run out of space to live. Your facilities will not work. You will have only two or three people will have hot water in the evenings, right? So that's what happens when you overpopulate something. So if you do that to SharePoint lists, you will eventually break them. If you do it to Excel, you will eventually break it. Granted, we can push the limits a lot further than we could these days, but the complexity and the amount of data that you're storing in those data storage facilities is important. So what do you do? You upgrade. That's why Microsoft has been so big on modern workplace taking like large chunks of data and splitting it up to smaller tables or tabular structures like lists. So yeah, lists are actually pretty good. They're amazing to build on in the very beginning. Um, a lot of the organizations I have worked with and am working with trial actually proof of concept, a lot of their solutions inside SharePoint, and then move those over to Dataverse and uh, SQL and that when they get adoption of the platform, which I'll talk to you about shortly. Okay. And as you move up Dataverse for Teams, um, I love the concept. I love the idea. I think it's a really great way to kind of, again, do micro dataverse solutions to make sure that you're you're getting the right thing built out. But if you're getting to larger user accounts, you've got to move up into the high rise buildings of the data world, like highly relational, highly kind of lots of referential integrity, moving out to that dataverse type layer where you've got that ability to build out those huge, strong data structures that can be complicated. But again, you may actually get start maxing out on your pricing especially when you're doing like millions of records. So you may want to move out to SQL and use virtual tables to reference SQL from a storage perspective, okay? So what you'll start seeing is that a lot of the time, these things, these tools will start working together, depending on the data you're storing. Another thing that's important is not all data is made equal. Like I said to you before, data has layers. Storing personal information for me is more important than storing public driven information because I know if public information is deleted, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Whereas if I expose personal information, like the retailer hack that happened some time back, that's bad. Also, I'll tell you something else interesting. Um, if you go on to, there's a bunch of like dark web sniffers out there and things that can actually tell you if your Gmail password and stuff has been pre-used. So I use Norton for that and actually tells me but that data is personal data that's somehow been leaked, yeah? So your data source is important, very important. Now, my theory here is how confident are you that the data you are capturing is safe, secure, and can be audited and shared with the owner at the drop of a hat? So if Gabriella said to me, hey, Chris, I need the data you have on me right now, like you need to get it to me, how easily can I give her that data? If I'm audited in the courts of law and somebody says to me, hey, Chris, you captured a bunch of health and safety records. Please show me every single one, the times and dates those, record, those records were tracked and who captured them. Can I do that with the data source that I'm using? Let me tell you something. Cost, the cost of storing data becomes irrelevant when you're looking at things like what will happen if you don't manage the data correctly. So the cost of not doing this is far more expensive than the cost of doing this, right? So today, if you take anything from me, please understand that it's well worth making sure that the data is in the right place. And we're halfway through and I haven't even spoken to you about making an app yet. That's how big this is. So when we look at what you call the bottom up, top down approach to making apps with data, people have got all different ways. And Victor mentioned this to you on the call. Some folks start from the user experience down. I'll say, Sergio, man, tell me, what's your user experience? Like, what do you want? Do you want the icon and cornflower blue? Do you want to have 18 screens, six process bars, and a squirrel doing backflips? Like, what would you like? And we go through this whole process of doing theming and user experience and the actual user journey all the way down to where the data is stored. And we realize, actually, you know what? We can't store this data. We don't have the right storage facility. Or, you know what? The solution budget you have for this is probably like, I'm just using 5,000 euros, but actually the data storage alone is gonna cost you 20,000 euros. Is it worth making? I love the saying, is the juice worth the squeeze, right? And often the concept and conversation comes down to the worst possible thing in the world and that's licensing, which is why I knock that bad boy out first. I go straight for the, I go straight for the jugular, go straight for figuring out what, where the data is stored, 
how important the data is. And if I can categorize that and I can say, you know what, we've got a good place to put data. We've got a great mechanism to actually build a solution out from this. Then I'm like, let's go, that we're gold, All right? But I found for me, and it's not like this for everyone, if I go look and feel and user experience first, I struggle. And I end up a lot of the time with an infosec discussion, okay? So you're saying, why, Chris, why? I cannot justify talking about making something pretty if you aren't willing to talk about where your data is and if it is looked after. Data before the app for me, every time, right? You might design the app and realize you don't have the correct storage facility or, or even money to pay for it. Folks, this whole thing is just about connectors. In Power Platform, it is all about connectivity, right? Microsoft in low code in Power Platform only really license on two things. They license on consumption. So amount of space you're using, amount of APIs your calls you're using, and connectivity, the stuff you're connecting to, okay? So do you, we have to do our math. We have to start thinking about it. Before designing, before I start designing apps and screens and automations and things, I need to know what I'm connecting up to. Now, the most important thing is that not all solutions are made equal either. And I said this in the last session in the ALM pieces. Not all solutions are made equal, folks. It's just the way it is, right? So the way that I see it, and this is a slide um, nicked from one of the Microsoft decks many moons ago. I think Kim Dupois or Carsten put this together. I'm not super sure, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really good slide. I love it. It speaks about the types of things you're building as a personal team productivity solution versus the types of things you're building as organization-wide initiatives. Okay. Now, here's the thing. You can do this. You can't do this backwards. So I can't build an organization-wide initiative on top of a SharePoint list. There will be, okay, 60% of the time, this is right every time. There are going to be outlying areas like making a kudos app, okay? Quite honestly, a kudos app is a great example of something you could chuck into a SharePoint list. Nobody's going to think twice. It's internal to the org. It's probably, you know, focused more on the team, right? So that's not going to be a huge thing to worry about, I reckon. There could be other anomalies out there, but there's, you know, that's typically what I've seen. But you can build upwards. So if I build a personal or team productivity solution on top of a Dataverse data structure and I license it for like five users, sure, they're going to be paying a premium connector, but they could be using SharePoint for that. So that's like buying a Ferrari and driving it five meters down the road every day. It is cool. It'll work. It goes fast. It looks epic. But I'll tell you what, <laughs> that, that team productivity solution, it doesn't need it, right? Also, depending on the type of data you're storing. So when we're building solutions, we have to stop fixating on the licensing cost and start fixating on the value and how to protect the customer from themselves. And that's customers internally, I'm at a partner, customers externally, and Microsoft themselves, right? Start thinking about what actually happens when people put data in the wrong place. Yeah, I had a very interesting conversation pre-COVID when the Power Apps license per app user was something like 10 bucks, uh, $10 per user per month. And we were sitting at a canteen in, a, in an office and the chap I was talking to went and bought himself a very expensive cup of coffee. I think it was like six pounds or something crazy like that. It was like some pumpkin vanilla latte with cream cheese and a badger. I don't know. Anyway, and um, I said to him, so, dude, you're pretty good at paying six pounds for a cup of coffee, but you won't pay a discounted license for a Power Apps per user and store your data in the right place. It just blew my mind. Like, I couldn't understand the correlation. Like, I'm super happy to drink my big mug of tea, but I'm really fine to get fined 4% of my annual revenue. That's a firm no from me. Yeah. It's about making the contra It's about making the comparison. Yeah. Here's the other thing that I discovered is that when people build solutions, especially in Canvas apps, I can knock out a Canvas app build on top of Dataverse about three times faster than I can knock out a Canvas app build on top of SharePoint. You know what? I'll tell you something. Building in functionality and start on top of a personal pre uh, on top of a personal productivity data source, you're going to spend the time anyway on the development. So just pay for the data structure and solve two problems with one stone. It's really straightforward, right? So here's a theory, and I normally show you a terrible tattoo and a great tattoo, but I'm cold. So <laughs> a great a great quote by Ben Franklin. He says, "The bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of a low price is forgotten." This happens every time. People are super happy to pay for a cheap solution there and then, 
and then overdo it and don't think about the repercussions of building an app on top of a certain structure. Okay. So now here's the thing. I'll get into licensing. Okay. Cheap is not always good. Cheap is nice. Cheap is cool. Cheap leaves scars, my friends. I'll, I'll, like I said, it's not easy. And when looking at the Power Platform licensing structure, you have to start doing your mathematics. And I want you to look at something. $20 per user for unlimited apps. Okay. So if people don't see the value in solving one problem with Power Platform, just solve more problems. When you're, when you, you're purchased Office, you didn't buy Office to send one email or create one Excel document. You bought Office to do lots of things. You didn't buy Office to have one Teams call. Hell no. You bought it to have lots of Teams calls. But the thing is, if you're looking at licensing one app, you'll soon realize that that becomes very expensive. It's Power Platform, not Power App Form. So thinking about the data, thinking about the connectivity and the cost is really key, but you have to make the juice worth the squeeze. Now we have this problem in Power Platform because when we're saying we're gonna use premium data structures, we, we whine and complain because it's free with Office. Nothing's free. If it's free, you're the product. Let me show you Salesforce's licensing. Salesforce licensing costs you $100 per user per month, right? Oh no, Power Platform's so expensive. We shouldn't be using premium data sources. We should be building everything on top of SharePoint lists. And then people go and look at Salesforce and <laughs> it becomes a bit of a problem. Yeah. Do the math. Stop making comparisons between SharePoint and Dataverse. It's not the same thing. I have to do that. I'm guilty of it as well. So when building apps, do your mathematics up front. Okay. Think data. Fine. Do your user stories, they're important, but think data. What am I going to use and why and how if you plan it properly? Don't do it later. Don't go through the process of building an app and just having it kicked out by InfoSec. That's not a way to do it, right? So when I look at this process, I start thinking use cases, right? I love a use case. So first couple I built were good one. And I did this presentation with a pal of mine called Paul Cumsey, and um, he helped me to realize the value of using different data structures. But thinking like time and expense management, timesheets, really great opportunity for a SQL, but tracking expense documentation in, in SharePoint, fine. That's not a bad thing to do. What about the Kudos app? Really good one for Dataverse. You could have a Kudos app in your team, smash it into Dataverse for Teams, uh, pop them into a team site, 10,000 users, kapow, done deal. No problems there, no issues. When we start thinking wider, health and safety. If you have a health and safety case that goes to court, you have to take that data to court with you to prove. Are you happy with that transactional and relational data living in SharePoint? Are you confident that the SharePoint security model can map that data correctly? Are you confident that you can prove that? And the answer is no. <laughs> Put it in Dataverse, at least you've got high auditability. And finally, one of my favorite ones is environment social governance. Data is critical and private. People are registering their interests in charities and causes. Okay. Often it's localized per region. So I use Dataverse for that. And in fact, actually, part of your homework is to think about this if you want to do it. I'll give you a data set and share, I'll give you a data set in Excel. See if you can split it out. But environment social governance is what I'm thinking of building for the next session. And I will build it live in front of you to show you how to do this and how to plan. But the first thing I ask myself is these questions. Once again, what, where, what, what, is, who, how, what, is. Could make an acronym out of that, or how was, yeah? And um, when I look at the data and I start tracking back to my ESG records over here, yeah, I want to run you through something real quick. Take a look at this. There is a personally identifiable piece of information there. And there, there's a localization there and there. You have relational information there. Oh, that's an interest over there. Another interest over there. You have your involvement type, which is private. So you don't always want to know that. You have your channel that it came in, which is fine. Your date of registration and the time contributed to that cause. So now you're thinking, why would I put that all in one SharePoint list? Is the data, what is the data classification? Where must, where must the data be located? What is the level of security? What is the retention required? I've got personal information in there. Is there a roadmap for the data? Well, we don't know. We didn't ask me. Who owns the data? 
How much data is there? There's over 2,000 records. What is the complexity? Medium, it's relational. I've got lots of things in there, like time and people. Is the data already in another system? Yep, it's in SharePoint. What did I tell you? Challenge. Challenge back. Are you sure that you want to put your data there? And are you aware of the ramifications of somebody logging in a subject access request or data being moved into another list or copied? So think about it, right? You've got multiple people in the system. You've got multiple causes per person. You've got multiple time records per cause. You've got causes in a specific area. It may need anonymization. You've got one to many relationships and many to many relationships, many causes related to many people. The system may grow into a much wider thing where I'm not just capturing time records, but I'm capturing expense information as well. But you know what, folks? The answer is Dataverse, but the org don't want to pay the money. So what else can I do? It's talking about value, talking about risk mitigation. I'm not selling you one app. I'm selling you a mechanism to protect your data. The app is just a layer on top of it. So when thinking about it, you're allowing people to capture data into a storage facility, right? Through an interaction layer, like an app, and the app will be the thing we build next time. But the value of that is I've been able to centralize it. And if I start thinking about a very basic data model for this, I'm going to flash this up. I'm hoping you're going to think the same. Think about the use case. I want people. I want my system to store people. I want to have people records in here. That might be called a contact in Dataverse. It might be called a person record in another system. I want to be able to track the time spent per cause. I want to be able to categorize the causes and put these people in different countries. I want to track their interest types. So we have to start thinking about the type of data we're storing and why we're storing it, right? So for me, I haven't even made an app yet. And in fact, as I showed you previously, making the app on top of a SharePoint list going from a data first process is relatively straightforward. Here's an app, right? I'm not starting from making it look pretty. I'm starting from building directly up from data, but the problem is I'm building it all in one place. I don't have that referential integrity. I don't have those rules around security. Anyone that's got access to the SharePoint list has got access to the SharePoint list, right? That's just how it is. So for me, I feel like making the app is probably one of the easier parts. Managing the underlying data structure, in my opinion, is a much harder task, because if you do that properly, you can build 50 apps on top of that stuff. And that's where it gets really interesting. And that's where you're using a platform. You can microservice some of that data and functionality and actually allow other people to start building things. Here's my app. I can make it look okay. There's an orange theme over there. Yeah, look and feel. Christine would be turning in her sleep if she saw me doing that. <laughs> she is the UX queen. But for me, I'm very functional. The place I start is from a data up approach. So me being able to build an app on top of a SharePoint list that quickly, that's fine. That's building from data upwards. And in fact, when Microsoft did, started this process as well, in make.powerapps.com, there was a tab that said build from data. I'm not going to go in there now. Fancy that, hey? Could you imagine them thinking about this as well? But it's great because that's their goal, is to facilitate data storage. So for me, folks, it's bottom up every time. Okay, I still, I've been doing Power Apps since inception and been doing Dynamics, Dynamics since 2009 or something. It's 2009 or 10. And for me, it's always been a data up approach. I respect the fact that I am from the world of dynamics, therefore data up for me is really easy, okay? I understand it, like it just makes sense. And I appreciate the fact that other folks will need to learn about the data up approach, right? But as I said, it's starting to think about where things will live and why. And if we all fixated on the concept of storing data in the right place, most of the things we build in Power Platform would make it through info security like this. We wouldn't have the bounce backs. So when I start thinking about it, number one, understand the importance of data, so key, okay? It's not always about making an app. I'm building solutions right now on the Power Platform that don't even, there's no such thing as an app to us, okay? Number two, understand the problem you're solving it and the options. A single data source is not always the answer. So sometimes you might need three or four, okay? Especially when it's Canvas. Like Canvas is like, it's brilliant for bringing that, those data structures together as can, uh, through the connector layer. Then finally, data-driven, uh, English words, data-driven design is not always about what's cheap, but what is best for your people, the people that you are helping. So when I'm designing my solutions and building my data models, 
I think reusability, I think, can I reuse this stuff? Is it secure? Do I have the right security roles and privileges in place? Okay. And where do you get to learn all of this glorious information? Well, first of all, if you want literally the world's most boring read, go and take a look at the General Data Protection Regulation from Microsoft Learn. Um, I've had to use it to answer tenders. It's not fun, but it's good to know. Right. Understanding data privacy. So Microsoft have got some amazing resources in the trust center. And actually, we're using Power Platform, folks. You got, we got to know this stuff, right? Understanding this data storage and Power Platform. So learning about connectors, right? And learning about, you know, what you can do from a governance perspective. And then obviously the most important part of Power Platform is the connector layer. So building apps and, and, and uh, flows using the connectors. So in this session, just please remember, the goal was to give you an inkling and an understanding as to why the data first approach is the most important that I believe. Again, you don't have to drink the Chris Kool-Aid. It's up to you to decide. And you're going to see some amazing sessions from Geetha, Christine, Leo, and Daniel, where they'll be talking about design and using the tools in the platform to make amazing things. But first and foremost, every single time, data is queen and king of the platform. Right? It always has been. It always will be. OK, but if you choose to design differently, that's totally up to you. I just know data first works for me. So again, a huge thank you, folks. I know that's been a lot. It's been a little scary, right, to learn about some of the regulations and things. But I promise you it becomes a lot easier when you start getting the rules in and you start learning what data sources to use, where and how. OK, so again, thank you, folks. You are legends. And Victor, thank you, as always, for having me. It's much appreciated. Man, this this is really good. I, I, I want to echo Chris's. Uh point of view when it comes to to design applications data first and and here's my experience though i've i've dealt with a number of organizations in the last i'd say two three years where they come into the power platform in two ways one being we didn't know what power platform was and then we opened the gates and a bunch of people in our organization is now creating apps and we have to 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 uh to control that bull again you know, they just opened the gates. They didn't know how powerful it was. People started to build apps left and right, and now they have to control it. And then you have organizations that are on top of the game. They understand the power of the platform and what digital transformation is all about. And they say this, I want to get ahead in the game. I want to do a prototype that is uh, app and data driven. And then from there, once uh, the the executives see the value of the platform, I want to have a strategy for bringing the whole company together and having power platform. And and in that sense, Dataverse as the central central brains of uh, digital transformation. So I've seen it time and time again um, lately, where Dataverse becomes a central uh, point. Uh, I'm not saying that Dataverse becomes the, the main database, like Chris pointed out. If you have loads of data, massive amount of transactions taking place, and already there is a system of record or an ERP that, that's handling the information, that Dataverse shouldn't really take the place for those systems. But you want to bring the data somewhere uh, where other systems can consume it, especially, you know, uh, approval systems, uh, systems that will uh, be more visible to upper management, um, information that you want to control and treat before you put it on a Power BI dashboard, you know, um, that, that would be a good place for that. So Chris cruised through an exercise that he, uh, he made available to you, you know, creating a, a database or data structure based on an Excel file. We'll make sure that it lands in your hands. Yeah. I will put a link out here for um, a lesson that we gave last year on database design in Dataverse. So we talk about field types, we talk about uh, fields being required or not, how to do that, when to use um, uh, many to many relationships, when to extend a table into another table, so on and so forth. So you can have a look at that as well uh before you perform your exercise and uh depending on what people bring maybe we'll, we'll have a prize for for the best uh solutions or the the designs so that is yeah. that would be a, a cool thing to do chris you have yeah, any, any no, more that's, that's pretty much it i'll send a summary email over to you victor just like of what i drew and why and then i'll add the dates in i'm actually gonna 
what I'll do is I'm actually going to give you the data in Excel, then I'm going to give you the breakdown and how I did it in Excel for the tables and that. So it'll give you an idea of how to model and things. And then the goal will be try and take that yourself, give it a give it a crack. Literally, it will take you 30 minutes, right? And um, it's good fun to try. And when you look at that data exercise, you will literally never look at Excel ever again. And yeah, I'll uh, I'll make sure I get the Excel. Oh, I, I don't know, Victor, how are you sharing this stuff? Email okay? I think Victor's frozen. Yeah, all right. So I'll make sure I get all it right to Victor. Yeah, there we go. You're back. Sorry, dude, you froze. Cool, cool. All right. Anybody else has uh, questions, concerns, comments? Nope. Thank you again, folks. All right. That's it. All right. We'll see you on on Thursday. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Thank Good you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Victor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.